Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome back to another Even Fall service, uh, another opportunity to worship our Lord on this, um, his day to honor him all day long. So let's go and ask his blessing on the time that we spend together. Let's pray. Our dear Lord, once again, we are very grateful to be able to, um, to meet together, um, to have a beautiful facility to do that, to have a facility with air conditioning to do that, um, but just, just the privilege of uh, having a second service uh, to be able to worship you in the evening as well as in the morning. And we know that this is special to you because you like it when we worship you for a full day's worth on your Sabbath. So we pray that you'll bless our time together, um, that your spirit would fill us, that you would quicken us to your presence, that you would teach us from your word, that you would hear our prayers, that you would bless us through the means of grace, the, 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 the sacrament that we will take a little bit later on. So I thank you and we give you the glory and pray that you'll be pleased with the the meditations of our hearts, and the thoughts that are in our minds. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Well, as you know, um, Brother Byron is not here, but that does not mean we do not hear from a local hymnodist. Uh, not only has Brother Rick to, uh, stepped in to lead worship this morning, but I kind of threw this at him after the service, and... Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and he said, sure, I, I, I'd like to try that. So I'm going to turn it over to you, brother, and you share some information that you have on, on one of the hymns or the songs that we sing. absolutely love and I've, I've made this part of my daily devotional because it's oh yes uh, yeah I made this part of my daily devotional because it's not only has stories about the hymn writers but it has the actual hymns next to the stories which is unusual in a book like this to have the full hymns in it but um, and there's a lot of interesting stories but this one in particular I, I really love and I wanted to share it because it really shows you know there's got to be thousands of interesting stories out there of how people came to faith. because And this story just shows God's inventiveness, how he brings somebody to a, to a, a saving faith. So I'm going to read. Oh, I think it's on page one. And this is from the words. That this is The hymn is Revive Us Again, and it was uh, written by William uh, Mackay. He was, he was a, this was in uh, the 1800s. He was a Scottish doctor. And these are his own words of how he came to be saved. So, uh, my dear mother had been a godly, pious woman, quite often telling me of the Savior, and many times I had been a witness to her wrestling in prayer for my soul's salvation. But nothing had made a deep impression on me. The older I grew, the more wicked I became. One day, now remember, he's a doctor, one day a seriously injured laborer was brought into the hospital. The case was hopeless. He seemed to realize his condition, for he was fully conscious and asked me how long he would last. I gave him my opinion in as cautious a manner as I could. Have you any relatives whom we could notify, I continued. The patient shook his head. His only wish was to see his landlady because he owed her a small sum of money and also wished to bid her farewell. He also requested his landlady to bring his book. The book, they called it. He called it. I went to see him on my regular visits at least once a day. What struck me most was the quiet, almost happy expression constantly on his face. After the man died, some things about the deceased's affairs were to be attended to in my presence. What shall we do with this? Asked the nurse, holding up a book in her hand. What kind of book is it? I asked. The Bible of the poor man. As long as he was able to read it, he did so, and when he was unable to do so anymore, he kept it under his bed cover. I took the Bible, and could I trust my eyes? It was my own Bible. 
the Bible which my mother had given me when I left my parents' home and which later, when short of money, I sold for a so small amount. My name was still in it, written in my mother's hand. With a deep sense of shame, I looked upon it. I can't, I can't even read this with a, without getting choked up. The precious book. It had given comfort and refreshing to the unfortunate man in his last hours. It had been a guide to him in, into eternal life so that he had been enabled to die in peace and happiness. And this book, the last gift of my mother, I had actually sold for a ridiculous price. Be it sufficient to say that the regained possession of my Bible was the cause of my conversion. So I love that story so much. So I hope you're familiar with this. Uh, you'll probably recognize it. Uh, but let's sing this together. Verses 1 and 3. We praise thee, O God, for the son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and hath cleansed every stain. Hallelujah. Thine the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory, revive us again. Amen. Amen. Gosh, what a wonderful testimony that is. What a great story. Thank you, brother, for sharing that with us. That's that gives that song a, a whole new um, light, doesn't it? Isn't it great to, to see the background of some of these things? Can you imagine the, 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 the amazement on that man's face when he looked at that Bible and it was his? Man, oh man, I didn't expect that. That, that is something. The Lord does indeed work in amazing ways to, to bring his people to himself. Let's read from the Old Testament real quickly. Um, I think that's important because the Old Testament is the, is, that's the text that the early evangelists used. Um, you, you can just imagine Paul going from synagogue to synagogue all through the um, diaspora, the Mediterranean basin, and everywhere he went. He's using Old Testament scripture to argue um, the Christ. Now, this particular psalm that we have, we're going to be looking at Psalm 13, a very short one. This is another one of David's psalms. It's not a messianic psalm, but it's very, it is very representative of the kind of psalms that David sang. He, 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 he tended just to blurt out what was on his mind, just to blurt out what was his need, and quite often it turned to whatever was oppressing him at the time, or quite often whoever was oppressing him at the time. But it always, it, it always turned. It's like he couldn't keep those things on his, in, in his mind very long. He'd have to turn and give glory to God. And that's what we're going to read here. Psalm 13, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Who among us has not prayed that prayer? Who among us has not, in the midst of our trials, cried out to God and say, have you forgotten me? You know, here I am. Uh, I, I, I need your help. And I, I feel like you've just walked away from me. And that's why it's so comforting to read. We, we know David was a man after God's own heart. And so we know that if he has this same kind of a feeling in the midst of his um, uh, things that he's going up against, that, 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 that is, means there's hope for the likes of us. Uh, verse 2, how long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? David had real enemies. Um, he had real people trying to really kill him uh, all the time. He, he was facing that, uh, even later on when he was more comfortable as king, uh, he still had 
great challenges, even from his own households. So he cries out to the Lord and say, Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. Now, I've not prayed that prayer um, because somebody was trying to kill me. But I have prayed that prayer because I have an enemy who wants to see me fail, who wants to see me come to naught, who wants to stand in between me and the ministry that the Lord has given me. And I know he does the same thing with all of you. So when David cries out uh, about his enemies, it, it is our enemy as well would fit this uh, very completely. And he ends it, of course, the way he loves to end things. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. And I'm not sure that non-Christians would understand the, the mood switches, the mood changes in a short psalm. From how long, dear Lord, would you forget me forever, to I have trusted in your steadfast love, and I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. And that, that is very much the, 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 the way that those who know the Lord act because we, we struggle and, and we, we have times of oppression and times that we, we, we're worried about things, but we always come back around to recognize that God is sovereign and we are his. And ultimately, um, this life will fade away and an incredible beauty and glory will um, await us. So um, these are very, very comforting um, psalms that, that we have. Uh, and we if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the second chapter of Paul's letter to the Philippians. And I'm going to read the verses 12 and 13 this evening. Which will be enough. It's two verses. But I was telling Kay on the way out here, um, one of the commentaries that I read regularly about Philippians is John MacArthur. I enjoy his insights. And he has an entire chapter on verse 12 and an entire chapter on verse 13. So there's a lot here, folks. Um, we'll boil that down to 30 minutes if we can. But here now the very word of God as it is given to us in the second chapter of the book of Philippians, reading verses 12 and 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work, for his good pleasure. And may the Lord truly illuminate our minds so that we can understand what Paul is saying in what for some people is a troubling verse. It really isn't if we look at it correctly. So let's go to him and ask him for that insight. We are so grateful, dear Lord, that your Holy Spirit is here to illuminate our minds so that we can understand things that that a, a, a might seem veiled um, at first, but once we delve into it, once we learn what the language means, what the words means, it, it, it makes an awful lot of sense, and it, it, it is not problematic at all. So I pray that you will give me the words to explain these words of Paul tonight so that we can make sure that we know that there is not even close to any kind of a conflict uh, being presented here. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, James Montgomery Boyce. Do you all know who James Montgomery Boyce was? Uh, a, a great preacher. Uh, and he, he's, he's current. He, he's not uh, ancient. He, I think he died in, uh, I want to say, uh, uh, right around the turn of the millennia, somewhere in there. Um, but um, he, he said this. He, he wrote a commentary on this uh, book in Philippians. And he said, no one can work his salvation out unless God has already worked it in. Let me repeat that. No one can work his salvation out unless God has already worked it in. And basically, that's my whole sermon. So I could send you all home right now. 
but I think that I probably should explain just a wee bit what that means and, and how it goes together. Now, we know as Reformed believers, we know that we have nothing to do with our... Now, I'm going to use my words carefully because normally I would say salvation, but I'm, I'm going to change it because salvation is really the word that is difficult here tonight. So we know that we have nothing to do with our conversion, with our regeneration, with our redemption, with our being born again. We know that that is something that is completely the work of the triune God. We know, first of all, that it is God the Father who chose us from all eternity past. Ephesians says, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. We also know that he calls. No one can come to Jesus unless called by the Father. That's what he does. Jesus said in John 6, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him or calls him. So we know that it's the work of the Father of election and choosing and calling. And then we also know that it's the work of the Holy Spirit that transforms our hearts, regenerates our souls so we have a desire to follow Christ. We read in Hebrews. Uh, I'm sorry, Titus. Uh, Paul writes to Titus and says, He saved us not because of the works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. And then, of course, as we just celebrated by taking these elements, we know that it was Jesus, the second member of the Godhead, in human form, incarnate, who died on a cross as our sacrificial substitutionary atonement, reading from Hebrews. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. Paul tells the Corinthians that for Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. The so bottom line is, and we know this, we know that as far as our conversion, as far as justification is concerned, as far as the atonement for our sins, as far as gaining the righteousness that is required to stand before God, we have absolutely nothing to do with it. Ephesians again says, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. So, when we talk about redemption, when we talk about conversion, we know that there are two parallel ideas that never cross, they never intersect. And one is the sovereignty of God in election, and the other is human responsibility for our sinfulness, okay? Those two ideas are both truths taught in Scripture, and they do not connect. But they do when we start talking about sanctification. Because it's not a, a, a work that is only done by either those who are being sanctified or by God himself. And, and, and you see, that's the question. As far as when the question of our sanctification is, who is in charge? Is this something that we do on our own and that the responsibility for our own growth and sanctification is on us ourselves? Or is this something that we just kind of stand back and let God take over? You know, the adage that sometimes is right, sometimes is wrong, is the let go and let God. You know, if we use that in the context of let God be sovereign, that's an okay statement. But if you say that in the context of let God do everything that there is to do and I do nothing, well, no, that, that's not the way that it is meant. Now, I'm going to try to answer that, or actually, I'm not going to answer it. Paul is going to answer that tonight. Um, and the way he's going to answer it is that that's an artificial distinction because it's not an either or, it's a both and. But before we get there, let me explain to you um, two solutions to this that come out of church history. There, there, are, there have been two ideas, and these are representative of many different ideas that have occurred. But when we start talking about who's in charge of our sanctification, we can look at two groups. We can look at the, a group known as the Pietists, 17th century Germany, and then we can look at a group known as the Quietists, which really come right down to today. And let me explain what those are. Pietism um, uh, uh, came about in Germany right at the end of the 17th century. And by that time, Lutheranism had become sort of a stale orthodoxy. 
It had turned cerebral. It had fallen into its traditions. If you remember the study, or if you've studied Luther, you know that he never could completely separate himself from some of the traditions of the Catholic Church. And so by the end of the 17th century, um, it, it has become very flat, very stale. And so pietism was sort of a rebirth. It was sort of a breath of fresh air. And, and, and they did many good things. It's like a lot of movements. There were good things and there were bad things. And one of the good things that they did is they returned to a vibrant study of Scripture. They took responsibility for their own um, piety, their own development. The, uh, and, and they met regularly in small groups and worked very hard to develop a Christ-like life, very much like the Puritans. But the problem is that they sort of strayed a little bit too far to the personal responsibility side. In fact, as far as they were concerned, pretty much the whole process of sanctification was on us. It was our responsibility to achieve that. Now, at the other end of the spectrum of the sanctification idea is what is known as the quietist. And I'll be honest with you, I've never heard of that term before. I read it in John MacArthur's um, commentary, but I am familiar with the idea. Quietism is simply, the, as I said before, the kind of let go and let God. That you have nothing to do with your own sanctification. That God does it all. He's the potter and you're still the clay. And the only thing you can do by getting involved and working out your own salvation or your own sanctification is, is to get in the way and mess things up. Um, MacArthur quotes a, a, a famous, apparently a famous Quaker, who says this about quietism. The soul abandoned to the working of the heavenly potter, is made into a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use. Now, the key word there is abandoned. It's completely given up. So I have no responsibility under that view of my own sanctification. So once again, which is it? Who is in charge of my sanctification? Well, Paul is going to make two statements in two verses that seem somewhat contradictory. In verse 12, he's going to say it's on you. In verse 13, he's going to say it's on God. But there's no conflict, as we will see in a moment. Now, let me put it into its perspective. If you were here last time and the time before, we looked at two of the most, well, several verses, but in different uh, ideas, two of the most glorious um, set of doctrinal revelations that you're going to find in Scripture. One writer, a man named Ralph Martin, says it was an odyssey from eternity to eternity. And James Montgomery Boyce calls it the great parabola. And a parabola is just a mathematical construct that starts in the same spot, has a curve, it comes down, then it goes back up to the same horizontal plane, ending up where it started. A U would be a good example of a parabola. And he calls what we read about earlier in this same chapter the great parabola. I think I would call it the glorious parabola because it talks first about the humiliation of Christ. And we saw his humiliation, his incarnation, a life of perfection, then the crucifixion, and then death and burial. The end of that you would be Jesus in the tomb. Then we saw the same trajectory but going up in exaltation through the resurrection, ascension, coronation and ultimately the mediation of Christ ending up in the same level of glory that he had left before he came in that great sort of U-shaped parabola. Now, the reason that that is significant and the reason that that is going to play into this is because Paul started that discussion because he was telling the church, you need to be unified, you need to be humbled, you need to be together in Christ. And so, now he's going to return to instruction. It's, it's almost like he's not going to give us any chance to meditate on that. He's going to return to the instruction and, it, and the reason for our sanctification, the, the whole purpose behind it. Do you need any greater reason than the glorious parabola, what Jesus has done, what we celebrate it in, in communion? So with that sort of as a background, let's take a look at the text 
first in the 12th verse. Now, we're going to have to take these verses apart because they are quite misunderstood, especially verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only is in my presence, but much more in my absence. Pretty important, therefore. Now, most of you know that when you run into that word, you, you look backwards a little bit to see what the author is bringing into this statement or this uh, uh, conversation. Well, obviously, what he's bringing in is the glorious parabola, what we just studied over the last couple of weeks. That's what the therefore, because of that glorious humiliation and magnificent exaltation. And those are the two ideas that we want to remember. And those are the two ideas that Paul is going to for, sort of focus on. First of all, the humiliation of Christ and all that that entailed that we've talked about over the last couple of times. And then the exaltation of Christ. Because after all, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord in heaven and on earth and under the earth. All of the cosmos will celebrate him as Lord. And so therefore, the reason for our sanctification, if you need one, is first of all, our humility should reflect the humility of our Lord. Because he humbled himself, that's the way we should deal with each other. And now, because he is exalted, because he is exalted back to the glory that he had before the foundation of the world, we should worship him and serve him as Lord and Master of our life. That's the, that's the reason that Paul goes into the need that we have for this, um, this, uh, 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 this in incredible um, time of, of growth in Jesus. So, first of all, the therefore, and then he says, my beloved. If you remember, way back at the beginning of this letter, we established that Paul was, had a, a very special affection for the people in Philippi. It, it was almost, as Barry Cooper said, this is almost like a love letter uh, to them. Well, he returns to that pastoral tone. He wants to preface. There's going to be some, some uh, discussion. He's going to rebuke them in some areas. But he wants to encourage them because Christians in that time, Christian in this time, we all need encouragement. And so he, 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 he talks about them as his beloved. That's the pastor in him. That's the shepherd in him. And he wants the people to know that no matter how tough things get, no matter how that trip through the valley of the shadow of death might be, that the one who was humbled to come down and save us and exalted to the heavens, that one is the one who watches after us. Even as David said in the beautiful psalm that he wrote, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That's the comfort that Paul is giving the people in Philippi. Well, he goes on and says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so obviously they obeyed his apostolic authority, and Paul appreciated that. They had always obeyed him when he was in their presence. So he goes on and he says, Now... Um, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence. That's really the proof of, uh, of the conviction, isn't it? It's not necessarily what you do when you're master, when you're teacher, when you're pastor, when you're whoever it is is there, but what you do when you're alone, what you, th when you think nobody is actually paying attention to you. And Jesus really, we could go down a rabbit trail here for a while if we, if, if we had more time because Jesus spent a lot of time talking about this. He gave multiple parables about wicked servants, about lazy servants, about servants that hid their minas in the sand. And they were always very harsh because Jesus wanted us to act in a certain way, even though he's not here. And Paul is saying the same thing to these people at Philippi. And, and, and then that leads to the confusing statement. This is what gets people confused. Um, and that's what he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. What on earth does he mean by that? What do you mean, work out your own salvation? I thought that my salvation was 
completely from God. I didn't think that I had anything to do with it. Is Paul telling us that we need to work somehow, that in, in some way we are to be busy about the work of our own salvation? Well, let's take a look at the words because this is important. The word for work means the same thing in Greek that it does in English. It means to bring about, now in this particular use of the word, it's not talking about working to make something that you hold in your hands. It means working to create a situation. It means to bring about a state or a condition by doing something to produce or to create. So there is no doubt that what Paul is telling us to do here is to be actively, proactively working for our own salvation. And I'm going to explain what he means by that word. That's kind of the key word in just a moment. But he, he, he definitely is saying that as far as whatever he's talking about, he wants our direct participation. So out, go, out of the window goes quietism, right? It, it is not let go and let God. God wants us, or Paul wants us, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, to be working actively for our salvation. Notice it, it is your own salvation, not someone else's, which quite often is the case. You know, I'll work for somebody else's salvation. No, for your salvation. You need to be working diligently for your own salvation. Now, the key to this is the meaning of the word salvation. And one of the reasons that this is going to be confusing to you is that words change over time. And they they, they have different meanings and, and use and quite often colloquially, just in modern lingo, we we use words interchangeably. And I do it. I, I mean, I'll admit it. And, and so that's why it could be very confusing to you. Quite often when I'm talking about the conversion experience, I'll refer to it as salvation. Actually, that's cutting the word salvation short. That salvation is more than just the conversion experience. Actually, we should wor use words like regeneration. We should use words like redemption because redemption refers to that redeeming aspect. So uh, is, uh, salvation is actually more than, um, than, than just talking about conversion. Now, here's a point that we need to make very clear. And Spurgeon really drives this home when he writes about this. Paul is not writing to unbelievers here. He is not addressing people who have not already made a confession, a profession for Jesus Christ. He is writing to a church filled with people that he's writing to the saved among them. So he is not talking about conversion. When he says, work out your salvation, he's not saying that you work by some kind of meritorious uh, uh, deeds that you, 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 you attain your own salvation. That's not what he's doing because he would be speaking to non-Christians if that was the fact. And he's not speaking to non-Christians. He's speaking to, um, to the Christians. And elsewhere, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Paul has clearly stated that, no, we don't work for our own conversions. Ephesians again. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. And as we always say when we read that passage, dead people don't work. Okay? So dead people are not going to work out their salvation. So Paul is definitely not talking along those lines. What we need to do is recognize the difference between redemption and salvation. Redemption is the Redeemer's work. It is the conversion. It is the work of the Holy Spirit. When we talk about salvation, it is much more. Let me read to you what the Greek dictionary says about salvation. This salvation makes itself known and felt in the present but it will be completely disclosed in the future. Salvation, in quotes, is plainly expected to be fully culminated with the second coming. So in other words, included in salvation is the effectual call. 
It is the election of God. It is the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. It is the justification that achieved by Jesus on the cross. It is the resurrection to the newness of life. It is a life of sanctification leading towards an ultimate glorification. All of that is included in salvation. Now, that's a broader word than we usually use it for. So when Paul says here, work out your salvation in fear and trembling, a much more clear explanation would be work out your sanctification in fear and trembling because that's what Paul's talking about when he says salvation. So the confusion is more over the word itself and the meaning of the word than it is in what Paul says because all he is really saying is no, you are responsible for working out your own sanctification. You are a value and important part of that. So work it out in fear and trembling. Fear is another word that can be misused or misunderstood. It doesn't mean terror. It doesn't mean horror. It means reverent awe, a holy fear, a healthy fear of God. And Paul wants us to be reminded that our God is holy. And when we approach him in any way, we do so with Fear and trembling. This is the teaching of Proverbs. Proverbs 1 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So the holier God is, the more reverent we should be, the greater the grace that occurs when that holy God brings us to the point where sanctification is even possible. Now, when we put this together, Put the words together in verse 12. Of what we're going to realize is that what Paul is saying to the Christians at Philippi, as he is to the Christians here, that you are responsible for working for your own sanctification. You are responsible. There is a responsibility that exists in you for your own development as a disciple. I've said it many times. You have something to say about your own discipleship. You have something to say about your own growth in Christ. You know, you don't have anything to say about your salvation, but you do have something to say about how you grow. You can either add to it, you can either augment it, or you can impede it. You, 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 you have something to do with that. So Paul is saying, no, we need to be involved with that. But now, in verse 13, it looks like he turns around and says the opposite, doesn't it? He says, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. I love this verse, by the way. First of all, it is God who does the beginning of this. You can't have sanctification without God. Let's go back to what Boyce said. And no one can work out his salvation unless God has already worked it in. So the whole idea of sanctification begins with the regeneration of the soul by the Holy Spirit. That, that, that is the, where everything begins. The Holy Spirit must change the heart. You must be born again. Are you really not going to have any desire to sanctify yourself in the first place? Oh, you may be interested in piety. You may be interested in making a good impression on the other people. You may want to be a good person and be held in high regard by everyone, but that's not necessarily sanctification. Sanctification is growing closer in the will and the work that you do to Christ, Christ-likeness. And if there is no work in the Holy Spirit in you, if that has not happened, then you're not going to be working towards being Christ-like. Paul writes to Timothy, by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. He's talking about now the conversion that occurs that makes sanctification possible. It is absolutely a necessary part of this. Now, William Hendrickson gives us, I think, a really good illustration. So see if this makes sense to you to kind of put these two verses together. He says this is kind of like an iron. And I, I think most of us have ironed something. I'm talking about an iron, you know, the, when you iron clothes. You know, most of us have an iron. And it's like, okay, so there you are. You've got this dirty, not dirty, but wrinkled shirt. Uh, obviously not a dirty shirt, but a wrinkled shirt. And you want to get the wrinkles out. You want to iron that shirt because you want to wear it later on. And you've got this iron to do it, right? So you 
work out your salvation by trying to iron out those wrinkles, right? But the wrinkles are still there. Nothing happens. What's wrong? Plug it in, dummy. Because without electricity, it doesn't do anything. The electricity runs through the cord, heats the elements, the iron becomes hot, you run over the exact same shirt, and wrinkles disappear. That's what Paul's talking about. You don't get anywhere without the Holy Spirit. Unless the Holy Spirit is energizing the sanctification effort, nothing's going to happen. By the same token, folks, you can have an iron that's plugged in, hot as it can be, and you sit here and say, okay, iron, fix the shirt, right? It doesn't move because you need to work out your own salvation, work out your own sanctification, but it doesn't happen unless the electricity and the energy has been supplied by the Holy Spirit. Okay, Jesus made this clear, 15th chapter of John. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Okay, he creates an, an example. Ver, the first Verse 4, he says this, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Same concept. All of the energy, all of the water, all of the resources, all of the minerals, all of that comes through the vine. As long as the branch is connected to the vine, well, the branch has got something to do. It needs to flower and bear fruit, okay? It needs to work out its sanctification because there's something that the Lord wants him to do. But you separate that branch from the root, from the, from, from the vine, it doesn't do anything. That's what Paul is saying here. It is God who works in you, both to will and to work. I think that's one of my favorite parts of this. Now, he's not talking about God's will and God's work. He's talking about your will and your work. It is the Holy Spirit of God that dwells in you, that lives in you, both to will and to work. In other words, the first thing that the Holy Spirit does is begin to change your will, okay? It begins to change that inner desire, that will, which is before you're saved... Here I go again. Before you're redeemed, before you're converted, right? You, your will is all about yourself. I just want to, say, to, to serve myself and to satisfy myself. But what happens when the Holy Spirit moves into us is he starts to change our will. And he starts to move our will from focused on ourselves to, to fall in line with God's will. And the more we grow in him, the more sanctified we become, the more we work out our sanctification, the more our will becomes aligned with the will of God. And so therefore, if the will on the inside of my heart is aligned to the will of God, then naturally the outward manifestation of that will, which is the work, is going to be aligned with something that brings God pleasure. And after all, that's the ultimate, isn't it? That's why we're doing this is for the glory of God, to bring God the absolute pr pleasure so that we are doing it in the way that God would want it. I love this benediction from Hebrews. It will be our benediction. I know you're used to me saying the same benediction over and over again, but I'll branch out tonight and give you a different benediction. This comes from Hebrews, and it says this. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. That's exactly what's happening. That's what Paul is talking about. He says it in Ephesians, in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So the application here is real simple for us. I mean, it's exactly what Paul has just said. When we talk about the conversion experience, when we talk about redemption, when we talk about being born again, it is 100% God's sovereignty. Now, we also have human responsibility. We are responsible for our sins that will condemn us. But at the same time, God is absolutely sovereign in that election and calling justification experience. But there is a relationship between them in the sanctification experience. 
You can't have one without the other. And that's because God has ordained it to be that way. Could God just, could we just let go and let God and God would fix us and, 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 and sanctify us and grow us in Christ? Yes, he could. But he has not ordained it that way. He wants you to be involved with your own development. Let's go back, and I'll leave you with this. Let's go back to that wrinkled shirt. I'm not a really good ironer. I, I, I mean, it's the reason I send my shirts to the cleaner. I'm just not really good at ironing. Um, Kay's a better ironer than I am, but she doesn't like it either. So, um, but imagine you've got that shirt, and it's covered with wrinkles. I mean, it is so wrinkly. It's clean. You've got to wear it, but it's all covered with, with wrinkles. Well, there's a process whereby you iron out the wrinkles of that shirt. And I just want to make an analogy because the, the electricity is the Holy Spirit that heats the iron. You are the one who is working out your own salvation. That wrinkle shirt is your life because you have all kinds of wrinkles in your life that need to be ironed out when you come to Christ out of the darkness of this world. And so you take that iron fully hot and you go to work. And you work and work until all the wrinkles are out of that shirt. And that's when you go to heaven and glorify it because it ain't going to happen until you're glorified and, and, and you go to him. But that's the process that we're talking about is ironing that shirt, ironing all the wrinkles out of it. And why do you do that? What's the purpose? What's the reason that we go about that process? Because of that glorious parabola that Paul talked about, that beautiful time when Jesus humbled himself to come down and save us and then exalted back to heaven as our Lord and Master. Do you need any better reason than that to iron that shirt till it's as perfect as it can be, right? So now you can go tell people that, uh, you know, ironing shirts, that's, that, 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 that's salvation <laughs> and sanctification. But praise God that he has brought us together with him in the partnership of our own spiritual growth. With that, let's thank him and go to him in prayer. Father, I thank you for this text. I thank you for a brilliant man like Paul who you called out of darkness and hatred of your church and gave such tremendous insight about these things. And I thank you for all those scholars who have thought and worked about this that we can go and read the things that they say and it can make so much sense to us. But the bottom line is this, it really, it, it's, it's, it's up to us. It, it, it doesn't start with us, and you have plans for us, and there are certain things that you are going to bring about in our lives, regardless of what we do. And if we lag behind, you're going to put a fire under us, because you have a certain thing that you want to happen in our life. You're not, you're not just winding us up like the deist to God, and then going away and saying, oh, it's all up to you. No, you want us to be involved. And that's the process and Lord, I just praise you that you have shown us and given us the means, the means of grace, your word, prayer, the, the sacraments, the fellowship, all of the things that we are involved with in this service are all the ways that you have given us to be sanctified. We give you the glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.